Uh, yeah, you may be you may be very happy. And it may take some time. Actually, what we see is that in most cases, and there are many cases, I will talk about it, when um, countries become independent through a referendum, the independence declaration is not the same day as a referendum. You may wait for a while, and I will, um, I will look at this hypothesis uh, in my intervention. Actually, um, I hope we'll have time for discussion. There are several things that uh, you say that I would like to comment or even disagree with. Um, actually, there are two things uh, I strongly disagree with. Uh, when you say that uh, Westminster Parliament is sovereign, there is no written constitution to bind it. It's not really true. Uh, I think the European Convention on Human Rights is binding the UK, and I know there's a lot of uh, fuss about it. Uh, your parliament doesn't like it, but it happens that uh, sometimes a judge in Strasbourg, not in Luxembourg, say, well, you know, um, UK is not following part of this EU constitution, which is not in the EU treaty, but which is the, or not yet, but which is the European Convention on Human Rights. So, there is certainly a constitutional debate at the European level, and I'll be very happy to uh, listen to the next contribution on that. I will slightly touch it, but I will mostly leave it to you uh, for uh, that debate. Uh, the second point, but I will explain that to you, uh, it's a very bad idea for Scotland to become signatory of the 14,000 treaties of the UK, or even 1,000. Uh, there is a much easier way. You can be a successor state, and I will try to explain that. Actually, it's a very important point of my presentation. So if uh, on September 18th the referendum goes through, uh, what I will look at is how it will affect mostly Scot Scotland. It probably will also affect UK, both on the international stage and in Europe, meaning as regard uh, EU institution. And again, I think that international law or supranational law or whatever you call it in Europe or EU law, but there's not only EU law. Again, as I said, the European Convention on Human Rights is certainly part of this constitutional pa European package. Um, we are at a level where our system is not purely classical international law. It's probably not equivalent to uh, some sort of a federal state or whatsoever. I know it's a forbidden word here in the UK, uh, but certainly uh, what is being done legally or constitutionally at the European level affects member states. So um, I will try to look at what happens in relationship to international law and more specifically to EU institution. And since uh, we'll have an intervention after mine on uh, EU constitutional reform, I will mostly focus on, um, well, the, the potentiality uh, for Scotland to preserve the implementation of European law on its territory. So the issue on the international stage is no big issue in my view. I'll go very quickly on that. Uh, you can read? Yeah, okay. Actually, it seems, as far as I understand, that the UK government agrees on the referendum being held, so they should not, in case the referendum go through, create any difficulty in recognizing the result, and so uh, Scotland could be quite easily recognized as a newly independent state. Uh, usually what we consider as the proof of recognition is to become member of the UN, because to be a member of the UN, it's Article 4 of the Charter, which says that you have to be a state. So if you're a member of the UN, that's a proof that you are a state. You, there are a few other conditions. Uh, I will maybe slightly come back on that. Uh, we have a very interesting example, which took place in 2006. Um, there was a special form of uh, constitution between Serbia and Montenegro, but in that constitution, Article 60 said, and I will quote, uh, I, I read Article 60 of this Serbia and Montenegro constitution, upon the expiry of a three-year period, member states shall have the right to initiate the proceedings for the change in its state status or for breaking away from the state union of Serbia and Montenegro. 
the decision on breaking away from the State Union of Serbia and Montenegro shall be taken following a referendum. So basically, it was in the basic law, the constitutional law, and it did happen. And as you see with the date, uh, the, the vote uh, took place on the 21st of May. They proclaimed the independence on the 3rd of June 2006, and they were member of the UN by the end of the month. So basically, it went very quickly. It is true that, contrary to Serbia, uh, the UK could block individually accession of a new state, any new state, including Scotland, but any new state to the UN because it's a permanent member of the Security Council and the Security Council has to take a positive decision on uh, the applicant's request to become a member. So in theory it could, but I'm sure they would not. So it's not a big issue on the international stage. What is more interesting is that um, I don't think it will be a big issue for UK. Uh, there was an interesting report published in 2013 by Crawford and Boyle on the fact that the UK will not be a successor state, meaning a new state under international law, but will be the continuing state, basically even if Scotland leaves, Scotland territory and population leave UK, UK remains UK. Uh, I think their arguments are quite convincing. I, I've been toying with the idea. Naturally, it would have been extremely interesting also as regard e UK member membership in the EU, because if UK is not uh, UK anymore, then the Scottish vote is not only for Scotland, but also for UK, who, who could find itself kicked out faster than they imagine uh, of the EU. But I don't think that's a legal situation. So most likely, um, UK will be the continuing state. Now, in international law, and this is why I disagree with you, uh, there is this statute of successor state meaning that a new state created from the territory of a state which was a subject of international law, this, the authority of this new state may make a declaration saying we want to be bound by the treaties that did apply before the day of independence or secession. And there is a Vienna Convention of 1978 on the succession of states in respect of treaties, I will come back to it, which uh, provide for that right to any newly created state um, with some limitation, but very few. Now, and I will also discuss that later, some debate whether this convention is applicable in Europe or not. I will explain why a bit later. But basically, uh, on the international stage, it's quite easy. It's in Europe that there are big issues at stake. Before dealing with them, I would like to uh, make three preliminary remarks. First, Europe is not limited to EU. I'm, I'm coming from Switzerland and we know it very well because we are, well actually we're quite involved with EU too, but we're not member of the EU uh, and we're still Europeans. Uh, by the way, we feel a bit uh, annoyed that the EU citizens call themselves Europeans, but like US citizens call themselves Americans, there are many other Americans than US citizens. Canadians and in the South, they're all Americans, and also in Europe, there are Europeans which are not members of the EU, but that's a detail. Um, most in interesting one, in my view, are OSC and Council of Europe. NATO, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to, to go into that, um, but certainly OSC and Council of Europe, I will come back on it, are important. One of the reasons is that they may be called already now to intervene uh, in the referendum process. Actually, OSC has an office for uh, human rights and uh, democracy, uh, which is based in Warsaw, and this office uh, monitors election. So, uh, for example, if you take the Montenegro case, uh, the OSC had observer who went to supervise uh, the referendum of, of independence. Council of Europe also had observers. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe is doing uh, election observation, and that would be a good idea to try to get them involved beforehand just to supervise the referendum. That would make things much clearer. You never know if you have a tight result, you may have strong mean debates about whether the result is valid or not. If you have international observer, it will help, and I see no reason why the UK should refuse to have international observers since it agrees on the principle of holding the referendum, except if it agrees on the principle and wants to cheat, but uh, that would be strange. So if they don't want to cheat, I think they can have observers. And naturally that would help uh, 
further relationship with these European institutions, Council of Europe and uh, OSCE. Also, um, there are some people who, will, who may be directly affected by the decision of Scotland to become an independent state. It's all the Scottish who are working in European institutions, or the Scots, sorry. Um, will they remain European civil servant? Will they be kicked out if their state is not member anymore? Uh, so maybe it's a good idea to try to create some sort of an association of uh, all these civil servants and to have them take positions. It could also help on the European debate. But anyway, uh, that's my first preliminary remark. Um, second remark, contrary to whatever has been said or could be said, uh, the fact that an independent Scotland will become a member of the EU if it wants to, you can refuse, like Switzerland or Norway, but if you want to, there's no doubt they will become a member state of EU. Um, first, there would be geostrategic consideration. Let's imagine that uh, UK, Spain, because they're afraid of Catalonia, Basque, and so on, say no way, Scotland never comes in. Uh, then Mr. Putin flies in and say, well, maybe we can have some sort of an agreement for, I know you have a submarine base here that you don't know what to do with, and two, sorry. Uh, but maybe Mr. Putin would be interested to have sub, you know, Russian submarines based here or whatever. So, so basically this idea of veto, sure, it's legally possible, but at some point politically uh, they, it cannot be used. And also um, if we take seriously, it's an open question because a lot of things happened since, uh, the Laken Declaration, which was uh, proclaimed by the European Council in 2001 in Brussels. Actually, Laken is just a nearby uh, neighborhood of Brussels, uh, where, where there's a nice royal property, by the way. Uh, and they say the only border for Europe is democracy. So basically, if you're a democratic state, you can uh, become European. It's not that easy. We've seen with Ukraine and other countries, it may be difficult. But anyway, that's the position of the EU. And also, if you look at what happened, uh, EU has this logic of enlarging, and it will not change, especially for territories such as Scotland, who are part of the core territory of EU. Uh, naturally, enlarging to the east, enlarging to the south are open question. To the south, it's not even open so far. Uh, but complete, completing the map is no problem. It's why the Balkans country will be in sooner or later and so on. So basically, Scotland will join sooner or later the EU. Also, uh, my last preliminary remark, uh, the consequence, the immediate consequence of a vote as regard EU uh, membership, citizens' rights as regard EU law will not be as dramatic as people pretend. Uh, we have some precedent. In Greenland, uh, they held a referendum in 1982 because they didn't want EC law to apply anymore to Greenland. Uh, they could not do it before when Denmark came in. They had no home rule, as they call it, so kind of devolution. They had that in 79, and then they decided, mostly because of their fishery policy, uh, to get out of EC treaty. They voted in 82, but it took until 85 to negotiate their way out. And they're not really out, actually. Uh, if you look at Article 204 of the uh, Implementation Treaty, how, how do you call it? In, no, treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, it says that they are an associate territory now. Um, more interesting even, uh, the Algeria case. Algeria, um, before having a good team in the uh, World Cup, uh, soccer World Cup, uh, they, no, you say football here, sorry. Football <laughs> World Cup. Um, no, you talk too much about America and so on. Uh, they were part of France. In 1962, they proclaimed independence. And clearly, if you look uh, at Article 198 and following, which is associate territory, basically it is for states whose external representation are ensured by a member state of the EU. And I can tell you, even though I was not born in 1962, but I'm, not sure, I'm absolutely sure that independent Algeria did not consider that France was representing it in the global world. It was, I mean, they, they had a war of independence, a bloody war and so on. So basically, Algeria was really an enemy state for France at that time. And still, from 1962 to 1968, there was a long transition period in which uh, EC rules, they were much less elaborate than now. 
it's true, but still, it did apply until 1968 in Algeria territory. So basically, there is no one day in, one day off. It doesn't work like that. We also have a very interesting case from the European Court of Justice, a Rotman case. I won't go into detail, but basically it was a guy, uh, Austrian guy, who acquired German nationality uh, fraudulently, actually. He didn't tell them that he had a lot of trouble with uh, justice in Austria, and the Germans gave him the nationality, German nationality. According to Austrian law, he lost his uh, Austrian nationality. Then the Germans, actually the authority of Bavaria, the Freistadt Bavaria, discovered that uh, he had lied to acquire the German nationality, citizenship, so they said, well, it's in our law, you cannot keep it, so they kick him out, and, well, he had no more European citizenship. So he went to the local court and had it asking a question, preliminary ruling to the European Court of Justice, uh, and the European Court of Justice basically said that, yes, states should abstain of depriving citizens, EU citizens, from their EU citizenship. But in that case, Mr. Rotman, because he had personally committed offenses, could be deprived of EU citizenship because it was his own personal fault. But it would certainly not be the personal fault of every Scots citizen that Scotland votes to leave the UK and so that they are deprived of the EU citizenship. So basically, here's a room for maneuver. And I think the best argument uh, comes from Switzerland. We have bilateral agreements, a lot of them, about 120 of them, with the EU, or EC, or EC plus member state. I, I don't go into detail. And we have one on the free movement of person. We also have Schengen uh, and so on. I mean, so to, to a large extent, uh, even though most people don't realize, Switzerland is more integrated within the EU policies than the UK. But anyway. Uh, but in this agreement, uh, it's a bilateral agreement and it can be terminated, repelled. And then Article 23, I've put it there, I hope it's big enough, says that in the event of uh, termination of this treaty, all the acquired rights will be preserved. So even with a non-member state only linked by a treaty with the EU, the right acquired by the individual beings should be preserved even if the treaty comes to an end. So very clearly, uh, for a territory which was part of a member state and becomes a new state, there is no way the EU will try to just say, oh, sorry, you're out, you have no more rights. Which leads to a complex question, and actually this is what uh, I would like uh, to uh, work on. And by the way, this principle that there is no immediate way out is now embedded in the treaty. If you look at Article 50, which allows a state to leave according to its own choice, the EU, it cannot do it unilaterally. Even if a state wants to leave, then it says in Article 50 there is a maximum two-year period to negotiate the condition for the state leaving the EU. So, very, very likely, there will be a transitory period. And this is what I want to talk about. And the fact that, uh, well, it's difficult because we don't have very clear rules, certainly not in the treaties, or in the EU law on what happened in such a situation. So, as a lawyer, I'm looking for precedents, analogies, and I've been looking around at some cases, and I will try to show you what I found. Actually, for this transitory period, there could be a critical choice for the U uh, Scottish authorities. Um, we have situation in Europe where a state has no sovereign control on part of its territory. So basically, following uh, a referendum, the Scottish authorities could say, well, until the issue of our belonging as a member state to the EU is settled, uh, we want to continue benefiting from the fact that UK, uh, which was the ruling uh, power on our territory until the 18 or whenever we make the independence declaration, want to benefit from that situation and to still be a special territory within the EU. And we do have some situation. Um, either state which are not part of the EU, which benefit from EU membership, uh, sorry, not part of the UK, like Gibraltar, and if you look uh, at uh, Matthew's case in front of the European Court of Justice, uh, um, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the obligation to organize parliamentary election for the European Parliament in Gibraltar, and which was not done at that time by the uh, 
British or Gibraltar government, uh, the UK government very clearly made the point that Gibraltar was not part of the UK territory. But still, a large chunk of EU law applies to Gibraltar. So th there are many uh, weird situations. Um, oh, sorry. I think... No, okay. Uh, we have opposite situation, where part of the territory of a state is not under control of the central government. Um, actually, the condition to be a full-fledged state are not defined in EU law. And uh, they're not even defined in international law. You have no treaty on how to become a state. Basically because well, law is being created by states. States and law coexist in our modern world. Like they're both, the, you know, it's the egg and the hen. Um, so, the chicken, 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 yeah, and the egg. <laughs> so it's more or less the same thing. We have the chance that in 1936, um, the International Law Institute made a recommendation on the condition to be a state. Basically, they were making a recommendation, a recognition, but then they define what it is to be a state. You see there are five points. Uh, have a defined territory, oh, sorry, there's a mistake, uh, with a human society, so a population. If, if it's a territory with nobody inhabiting, it cannot be, become a state. It needs to have organs, a government, politically organized. It needs to be independent from any other state and be able and willing to observe international law. Uh, in the EU, we have a very weird situation. Um, one of the most interesting is Northern Cyprus. Northern Cyprus is part of Cyprus, a member state of the EU, and occupied by Turkey, uh, well, a NATO member state, by the way, like Greece, but that's another issue. Uh, so what happens there? Well, very clearly, Northern Cyprus is part of the EU. I will show how. So we could imagine a situation where Scotland is not under the sovereignty of the UK, is not yet declared as a member state of the EU, but remains, because it was part of the UK, under uh, the umbrella of EU law. That could be uh, a, a solution, or the Gibraltar solution. Actually, if we look at Cyprus, when they join a protocol was added to the treaties, uh, to the accession treaty. It was a big accession treaty because it was coming in with nine other member states. You remember maybe in 2004 it was a big enlargement, 10 states. By the way, it's interesting to notice that out of those 10 states, six, that's more than half, were not states 15 years before, were part of other states, like Czech and Slovak Republic, like Slovenia, like the three Balts Rep Baltic Republics. Uh, so six new states, which did not exist 15 years before, became uh, EU member states. So this idea that uh, EU will not recognize a uh, state which just woke out of the former country, it's a joke. They already did several times, and they keep doing it. We've done it last year with Croatia. So, um, and, and they organize independence referendum. They even, unfortunately for them, had a war to uh, secure their independence, and then they were taken into the EU. So anyway, what does it read as regards Cyprus? Uh, well, as you can read, uh, even though uh, Northern Cyprus is not, uh, as it says, under the effective control of Cyprus government, the whole island is part of the uh, EU, um, of the EU as such, and subject to EU law, except that it is suspended. What does it mean? Well, if you look uh, at the interpretation given by the Commission, uh, and you can find that on the website of the Cyprus representation of the EU, uh, it very clearly says, based on the uh, Council decision of 26 April 2004, that, I quote, the whole island is part of the EU. However, in the northern part of the island, in the areas in which the government of Cyprus does not exercise effective control, EU legislation is suspended in line with Protocol 10 of the Accession Treaty of 2003. This means, for example, that these areas are outside the custom and fiscal territory of the EU. However, and that's interesting, 
The suspension does not affect the personal rights of Turkish Cypriot citizens as EU citizens. So basically, those living there, they are EU citizens. They cannot exert their rights because naturally Turkey is not part of it. But basically, they re, they, they're already EU citizens. So we could imagine a situation in which the individual rights of people living in Scotland, of companies made in Scotland and so on, would be preserved even though Scotland is not anymore under the effective control under the sovereignty of the UK. That's one possible solution. It does exist already. More interesting, even the courts uh, said in a quite interesting preliminary ruling uh, in 2009, actually it was a dispute about property rights in northern Cyprus, and de facto um, the, the one who was claiming the property right could not exert it because he could not go there. And they, they were, um, I don't go into the detail, but they were in Germany and uh, making commercial arrangement. And one of the parties refused to recognize the uh, property title of the other person, and that had an implication for EU law. I don't remember all the details of the case, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, the court says that the suspension of the application of community law in the area where the government of the Republic of Cyprus does not exercise effective control, and the fact that the judgment which gave property right cannot be enforced where the land is situated, do not preclude its recognition and enforcement in another member state. So basically, even if Scotland was not under UK uh, effective control, was a special territory, the right who would exist there would have to be recognized everywhere in the EU. So that's a very interesting potentiality. Naturally, the drawback is that you do not claim to be an independent state immediately. And uh, that will lead to, uh, to some reflection, because we could imagine a kind of a protocol, like an inverted Cyprus protocol, saying, well, uh, we used to be part of that state. We will not be part of that state anymore in, in a given future. But in the meantime, we keep applying EU law on that territory. Basically, that could be done. Uh, or, as was done with Greenland, uh, actually, if you look at the treaty on the functioning of the EU, uh, Greenland is considered as uh, outre-mer, I don't know how you say it, or overseas territory, uh, and there is an article, Article 204 of the treaty, who specifically says that Greenland is not part of the Danish territory as regards the implementation of EU law, but is an associated country, even though it's part of the Danish territory for all the rest, uh, almost and they also want a referendum of, of independence, and they will have it sooner or later. But anyway, that would need a treaty revision. And unfortunately, it could not be a treaty revision on a simplified procedure. Now with the Lisbon Treaty, we've put simplified procedure, Article 48, Paragraph 6 of the Treaty on the European Union, but it only applies to the third part of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the policies, uh, and not on the fifth part, which is uh, association of a uh, of a sea territory. So basically, it means that in any situation, you will need a treaty change, as if you are a new member state. So probably, it's not worth trying this, uh, and it's better to try to become directly an independent member state, um, which become member of the EU. Does that mean that um, the EU law has to stop being applied in Scotland at any time, I will try to show you that no, there is no reason that uh, it should happen that way. Basically, EU law provides no rule on such situation. Um, actually, I quote uh, an interesting article by Professor Jacquet, Jean-Paul Jacquet, but he's not only professor, he used to be the general director of the legal service of the Council of the EU. So, well, he wears more or less both hat and his words wait a lot, and uh, he was writing an article on German reunification and said, well, that's a case where the treaty say nothing, there's no EU law applicable, so we need to turn to international law, and he turns to the 1978 Vienna Convention on the succession of state in respect of treaties. Naturally, there are other aspects of succession of state, it's only of belonging to a treaty. Um, this convention is a UN convention, and as all UN conventions, uh, it is a codification convention. So they're not making new rules, they're trying to codify the existing customary rule. 
even though there are debates whether some part of this convention are going further than simple codification. And one of the problems we have is that this convention is not very successful. It only had 22 ratification out of the more or less 200 states of the international community. So it's not very much. It entered into force in 1996. Out of the 22 ratifications, there are 12 in Europe and five in the EU only. So some could make the argument that this does not apply in Europe because European states, most of them, the five who accept in the EU, it's interesting, it's a Croatia, it's a Slovenia, it's Czech and Slovak. I mean, all those who became new states and who see the use, the usefulness of such convention. But anyway, so if the convention as such does not apply, if you look for customary rule, one of the important elements of customary rule is practice. So is there any relevant European practice? By chance, yes. First, what uh, does this uh, convention offer to a successor state? If we look at Article 17 dealing with newly independent state, that would be the case of Scotland, it says, I quote, a newly independent state may, by notification of succession, establish its status as a party to any multilateral treaty which, at the date of the succession of state, was in force in respect of the territory to which the succession states relate. So basically, Scotland does not have to renegotiate multilateral treaties. It can unitarily declare that it becomes part of it. But it doesn't work for the EU treaty. Because, as you see, paragraph 3 says that if the participation of any other state to a treaty uh, must be considered as requiring the consent of all parties, which is explicitly the case for EU treaty, the newly independent state may establish its statute as a party to the treaty only with such consent. So you will not escape having the consent of all the member states, including UK, including Spain, uh, before becoming a member. But even though, it doesn't mean that EU law will cease to apply. I base my reasoning on, again, once again, the case of Montenegro. As you know, um, Montenegro is not part of, or was not part of a country, part of the EU. But interestingly enough, part of the Council of Europe. Serbia and Montenegro was a member state of Council of Europe. And um, they proclaimed their independence on 3rd of June 2006, and they write to uh, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe on the 6th of June, and again on the 12th of June. One letter to uh, ask for membership and another letter to proclaim that they want to be successor to all the, state, all the treaties to which Serbia and Montenegro was party under Council of Europe law. Uh, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe received these two letters and decided as concerned membership that's following the practice, they need to have opinion from the parliamentary assembly on the candidate. So they could not immediately uh, give an answer, so membership would be delayed. Actually, took one year, they became member on 9 May 2007. They uh, said that, um, I quote, in accordance with the organization statute, membership could be granted once the Committee of Ministers, after consulting the Parliamentary Assembly, had found that the condition for membership were satisfied. So it decided to transmit the Republic of Montenegro's application for membership to the Parliamentary Assembly for an opinion. It takes time, but that's where it gets interesting. It decided as an interim measure that the Republic of Montenegro could take part as an observer in all the intergovernmental committees of experts in which it expressed at interest. So the, they remain as a member. Also, pending the examination of the Republic of Montenegro application for membership of the Council of Europe, decided that representative of the government of the Republic of Montenegro will be invited to attend the meetings of the Committee of Ministers. And that's a very closed meeting. I mean, you have observer states like USA and so on, they cannot attend. Montenegro, even though it was pending application, they were allowed to attend that. Even more interesting, with regard to the Republic of Montenegro declaration of succession to the Council of Europe conventions, of which Serbia and Montenegro was a signatory or party, agreed as follows. First, that the Republic of Montenegro was either a signatory or a party as appropriate to the open convention referred to in an appendix. So it means the convention that all states could become party of, not only member states of the Council of Europe. 
Concerning these conventions, called the closed convention, those you have to be a member of Council of Europe to be part of, um, the Committee of Ministers uh, decide, I quote, to take the relevant decision in due course on the European Convention of Human Rights and a few others. But this is the one that really interests me. Also, and that's very interesting for Scotland and for the constitutional debate, uh, it's dealt with what is called partial agreement in Council of Europe, which is actually some institutional creation within the Council of Europe. And one of the partial agreements concerns the Venice Commission, called Venice Commission because it was an initiative of the Italians, and it's basically, uh, the official name is uh, Commission for Democracy Through Law. It was set in 1991 to help Eastern European country draw the democratic constitution. And actually, all the member states of Council of Europe, except Germany, accepted to participate in that, even the UK, and uh, Germany, because they didn't want uh, European to get involved into the reunification process, now it's done, so they're also part of it, everybody is part of it, and they say that uh, Montenegro is immediately part to this partial agreement. So that would be interesting for Scotland because uh, you could immediately have the Venice Convention and you could immediately work with European specialists to validate any constitutional process that takes place here in Scotland. So anyway, um, what happens, as I told you, is that um, the request is being proceeded by uh, the uh, Parliamentary Assembly and the Montenegro state becomes a member state of Council of Europe on 9 May 2007. And there is a not verbal, a typical uh, diplomatic idea. I mean, it's a written text, but not non-written. Uh, anyway, that's the way it's called. Uh, of 11 of uh, May 2007, which say, I quote, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe presents its compliment to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and has the honor to notify that during its 1994 base meeting of 9 May 2007, the Committee of Ministers has decided to invite the Republic of Montenegro to accede to the Council of Europe and to consider the Republic of Montenegro with effect from 6 June 2006, so they go back, as a party to the following treaty, including the Convention on the Protection of Human Rights. So basically, uh, there is some sort of retroactive uh, decision, like you could not be a member, but actually there was no breach in the in application of this convention. And interestingly enough, uh, there has been a case in the European Court of Human Rights, which had originated in the Serbian Montenegro period, which reached the courts in uh, 2008, they took a decision in 2011, it takes some time, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, in that case, uh, the courts really ap accepted the idea that there was a continuing application. So that principle, I think, could be also, uh, well, maybe not implemented, but used as a precedent to say that European state, because remind, uh, I want to remind you that all the EU member states are member states of Council of Europe. So it is their practice, they have accepted that. and. Uh, European Convention of Human Rights has a supranational court jurisdiction and so on. So basically, there is a practice in Europe to accept this possibility for succession to multilateral treaty, including uh, the one creating international organization. Naturally, the case is a bit more complicated with the EU because here you have a treaty which is the European Convention of Human Rights and the membership to the organization. In the EU, it's the same treaty where you have the material law and the membership to the organization. But basically, I think the principles are the same. And um, what should happen on the 19th or 20 or 21st of uh, September is that cases should be sent to the European Court of Justice, preliminary ruling, asking how should we interpret this or that, what, whichever rule from EU law. Uh, it would be interesting first uh, to know whether the court accepts or not, based on the fact that the, the request for preliminary ruling comes from a judge who is not part of a member state. Even though most likely the first question asked would be about a period when the material law of EU was being applied because Scotland was still part of uh, the European Union through the UK. But that would be the first type of answer that the court will have to give. And second type of answer, uh, well, whether they, they implement or not. And naturally then there would come cases where the 
facts at the origin of the case will be after September 18, 2014. And once again, we should see what the courts say. My feeling is that the courts, uh, which is a genuine supranational organ of the EU, uh, will have a tendency to give right uh, to these questions and probably use whatever reasoning it needs uh, to confirm the continuing application of EU law to Scotland, even though Scotland is at the present time in a transitory period. So let me conclude. Um, what does it mean as regards EU constitutional reforms? And I don't want to uh, go on to the field that will be uh, dealt by the next speaker. But one thing that we have to realize is that if Scotland becomes an independent state and manages to get into the EU, it will not be the only one. There will be what we call a domino effect. We know Catalonians are willing to do so. The Basque has, have started saying so. Uh, I had almost 10 years ago a discussion with the uh, minister president of Bavaria who was already telling me, oh, you know, Slovenia could do it, so one day we will do it. So basically, uh, it will not only be Scotland that need to uh, justify a treaty revision, but the fact that it will happen several times. And by the way, uh, I think one of the great opportunities for EU is that this multiplication of new states will force EU to change uh, its institution, also the way this, the states are represented in the EU institution, because what was working for six and now more or less working for 28, will certainly not be working for 100 or 95 or 130 uh, states or whatever they need to be called, territories part of the EU, uh, in, in Europe. And also, what needs to be put into the EU law, into the treaties, is how does it work, this transitory period? I think the legal uncertainty is much too great uh, to be left open. And again, uh, we managed to have a disposition, Article 50 on, of the Treaty on the European Union, to decide how it happens if a state wants to leave. So we could also have provision of what happens if part of a state wants to remain in the EU, because there could be another case where uh, part of the state doesn't want to remain in the EU. That's another issue. But if, if it wants to remain in the EU but leave the state uh, in which it, it was uh, incorporated before. So very basically, there is a need for treaty reform on those specific issues, and we know treaty reform is coming uh, anyway. So um, that's what I think, I hope, will uh, happen in the next couple of months now. It's getting close. Uh, naturally, in democracy, it's the people who decide. So. Maybe people will not vote yes, maybe they will, but if they do, uh, it's certain that there's a lot to do even on the 19th. Thank you. <laughs>